Good morning. It's 92421. It's the first day of the Ryder Cup, and uh, everybody's obviously disappeared to watch that. Dr. Shetler's still in Europe, and uh, no, he didn't really get eaten by fall army worms, but he will be back next week. Uh, temperatures took a decidedly fall turn this week, um, with the both the rainfall and the actual temperature dropping back into what we might expect to be more fall-like conditions. Uh, a couple of things did pop up on the disease front prior to the rainfall. Rust was uh, starting to show up on older ryegrass lawns. Uh, on newly seeded lawns, we did have a couple of questions uh, on irrigation practice and pythium showing up. One thing that uh, should be made clear if you're putting down newly seeded areas, uh, preventative pythium application uh, would be recommended. Um, for those areas. Now, we, our cooler temperatures are probably going to mitigate any of those problems problems going forward. But uh, for reference for next year, one, uh, wetting the surface obviously is critical to maintaining seed germination and establishment, but that preventative pythium ac application is going to be valuable uh, as far as keeping plants growing and not becoming susceptible uh, to issues with uh, pythium blight in particular on our damping off on uh, newly emerged seed material. Uh, the golf outings are coming up for scholarship purposes. So the OSU ATI one is on Monday at Columbia Hills, still taking support. And the OTF event um, down in Dayton is coming up in uh, October. So take advantage of those opportunities if you get them. Um, online today, Dr. Gardner is going to take it from here, Dr. Gardner. All right, good morning, everybody. So what I wanted to mention today was now that it's all nice and uh, um, cold outside um, or getting colder is uh, talk a little bit about, um, you know, like uh, the temperatures that we see in the wintertime. So what this is, is a map of USDA hardiness zones. And this is the way that it appeared in the 1980s when I was a college student color coded and it corresponds to average annual minimum temperatures. And in Ohio, uh, back in the 1980s, we were a mix of zone five and zone six. And so it was expected depending on where you were in Ohio that uh, the low temperature would be anywhere from minus five to minus 20 degrees. That would be the lowest temperature that you would see in the winter time. And the latest revision of that map, same color coding shows that a majority of Ohio is in zone six. And so it's warmer in the winter time than it used to be. And actually they update these maps based on a 30 year average. Um, and I would say that at Port Columbus International Airport, um, we have actually had um, several years that it has been considerably warmer in the winter time. We've actually, even in the last couple of years had um, average annual minimum temperatures that are more conducive to like zone 7B or zone 8A but the 25 year average is one degree above zero. So the coldest that it gets at Port Columbus International Airport is on average one degree above zero, which corresponds to zone 7A. If you think about it, that is pretty much what you would have expected to see in Northern Georgia back in the 1970s. Now the disconnect here, I'm not saying that it's just as warm in the winter time as it used to be in Georgia in the 1970s and 1980s, but it doesn't get any colder here in the winter time than it did in Northern Georgia in the 1970s and 1980s. Because it's warmer in the winter time, we're starting to see plants here that we're not necessarily used to. For example, this. We've got crepe myrtles in Columbus that have been alive for 15 to 20 years. It's called Myrtle Beach crepe myrtles. You know, this is something that you usually see in South Carolina. This is a zone seven plant. This should not be able to live in temperatures below zero degrees, but we've got these that are 15 years old. Now, what does this have to do with turf management, you might be wondering. Well, we're also seeing a lot of weeds here that we're not supposed to see either. The Kalingas are related to the sedges, and these are plants that uh, we didn't necessarily have in Ohio last century, and now we do because it's warmer. And also the Paspalums, either Dallas grass or field Paspalum. These are grasses that we're not supposed to see in Ohio either, but we do now because it's warmer. And now we have our first confirmed sighting of Virginia buttonweed. Iodia virginiana. This is a perennial plant distantly related to coffee, and uh, this was reported at a golf course in the Cincinnati area to me just this last week. This is actually one of the most difficult uh, weeds to control on southern turf. It was found in northern Kentucky last year along the Ohio River, so it was only a matter of time, but 
just like with field pass palum, I started to talk about it in 2011 and people were like, yeah, Gardner, whatever. And now we see that more frequently in wider parts of the state. This is a plant that I think we might start to see, you know, primarily along the Ohio River to start with, but it might start to progressively get further northward over time. So this is what it looks like. So it's a vining plant with a relatively easy to identify cross-shaped flower. Um, but this is a plant that is extremely aggressive. And like I said, this is one of the more difficult weeds to control on Southern turf grass. Uh, in fact, our new department chair, Dr. Karcher said that they often recommended that you use glyphosate on dormant turf in the winter time. Well, that's Bermuda grass and that's not really an option for us here because our cool season grasses don't grow, go dormant. So fortunately, um, there is research out there that suggests that clopyrrolid or fluoroxifer in combination herbicides can also be effective for the control of that weed. Again, this is something that we're just starting to see in the state of Ohio, but those uh, pictures were provided to me by a superintendent who works in the Cincinnati area. So it's here, Virginia buttonweed. If you see a flower that looks like this on a vine that seems kind of aggressive um, in, it tends to prefer wet soils, but uh, this, this is a new weed issue for us um, here in Ohio. And again, um, because it's a little bit warmer than it used to be. Um, now, another weed that I wanted to talk about was wild violet. Um, I finally have a uh, population of wild violet that allows me to do some testing on this at the OTF center. And for those of you that have trouble controlling this weed, I feel your pain because I'm doing a funded trial, looking at the control of wild violet. And two weeks on, I'm like, I know I mixed the herbicides with the water before I sprayed this. It looks like I did nothing. Um, but it, so, I mean, what I'm trying to say is, is you know, th th this is an exceptionally difficult to control weed. Um, you know, that one, Canada thistle, uh, ground ivy, all of those, um, you know, are some of our more difficult to control weeds. And again, we tend to recommend three or four way herbicides that contain triclopyr, dicamba, a combination of those two, and chlorac or fluoroxifer. So those are the you know, herbicides that you should be looking for. Um, a note about ground ivy control um, with sure power. Remember, flumioxazin is what makes that work so well. That product we recommend in the summertime, you can use it at this time of year, but you have to warn your clientele that you're going to see a considerable amount or you could see a considerable amount of turf phytotoxicity that might last three to four weeks when you use that product on actively growing turf. Um, otherwise, again, three or four way herbicides that contain triclopyr, dicamba, quinclorac, and or fluoroxifer are what I would recommend for the control of those more difficult weeds. And that's what I have for today. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> uh, one last thing I want to follow up on. Tom mentioned seed and access and things like that, I think two weeks ago. Talk to a regional uh, seed distributor yesterday and um, a couple of things to be aware of folks. He indicated that, and this person has been in the industry for many years, so he's not uh, not just walked into it. He, he knows what's going on. Um, they have been told that because of the conditions that they've experienced in Canada, that only 10% of the crop uh, from 2021, no, sorry, only 10% of the 2020 crop is available at this moment of the fescues. So the temperatures that they uh, went through about 110 to 115 degrees in Canada killed 90% of the crop, all right? So there is a massive shortage of this. Similar problems have occurred with Kentucky bluegrass, ryegrass, and tall fescues. So <clears throat> when people are telling you that seed issues are abundant, they are abundant. Uh, this individual told me that they had to sign a very large contract, contract on a price that was TBD, all right, to be decided. So they don't know what they're buying their seed prices at. And so unfortunately, uh, you can expect that your prices are going to be higher. He's also buying on allocation and his allocation is currently 50% of what he was previously able to buy. So seed supply is also going to be extremely limited. This may take one and a half to two years to recover from. So if you have seed, and you bought at one price, you're probably like, hey, I should put it on eBay, but do not expect that you're going to be able to return into these stores and distributors and buy them for 
the price that you might normally expect. Budget accordingly, and also expect that these problems are going to continue for an extended period of time. Sorry for everybody to be the bearer of bad news on this, but it is something that we should be aware of. Um, and that doesn't mean you make it worse by all slamming on the phone to call the local seed rep because they probably still don't have any. But if you've got the opportunity to plan for stuff, try and plan for it as much as you possibly can. And as a follow-up, uh, we're starting to get towards the end of our weekly reports for Turf Team Time. So next week, expect it to be the last of the weekly ones. And then through October, we'll probably do two uh, and one more in November. Uh, weather dependent, of course, folks. And if you do have questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, but um, with the, the change in temperatures and the uh, uh, ending of what we might call the crazy season, um, the sentiment is that we are backing off on the activity with the turf team time. So again, that next week is going to be the last of the weekly ones and expect two more in October. Dr. Shetler will be back next week um, and we'll have an update. If we've had frost, then most of the armyworm problems are going to have dissipated. Uh, if you've had not, there's still going to be potential for some activity, but nighttime temperatures have dropped off. So that's probably slowed some of the growth and development of these pests. Thank you.